the next guy has, that you will have on stage here has been writing science fiction novels. But actually science fiction novels that are grounded in reality. So these guys just talked about interfaces and how TV is an interface and how you will consume content. But what, what will it be in the next 10 years or even the next 20 years? We'll be using Google Glasses, we'll be using maybe interfaces that directly are connected to our brain. This is exactly what the next speaker is going to talk about. He's, he's a very, very, very good speaker, so I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Please welcome Ramez Nam. Thank you. The stage is yours. Thank you, Paul. Good luck. Thank you very much. My name is Ramez Nam. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I was at Microsoft for 13 years. I've run my own tech startup. I've been a computer scientist for most of my adult life. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is a little bit beyond the frontiers of what you normally think of as the web. But it will be what you think of as the web in 10 years from now, or perhaps 20 years from now. What I'm going to talk to you about is the art and science of wiring the human brain, actually sending information from one person's mind to another. Because I'm not just a computer scientist, I'm also a writer of fiction. And in my science fiction, like this novel, I write about a technology people ingest that gets into their brain that allows them to send what they're seeing, what they're hearing, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, even their memories and their knowledge and skills from one person to another. Now, for some of you, this will not be a new idea. If you are familiar with modern philosophy, you may have seen this, for example, in the works of the great American philosopher Keanu Reeves, who famously said, when the computer downloaded information into his brain, I know kung fu. Now, this is not just science fiction, however. In fact, there's a long trajectory of networking our bodies in various ways. You have heard about all sorts of things already, from the Fitbit, getting data about your body, transmitting it out, uh, to more advanced technologies. This is an actual working circuit printed onto human skin that has wireless sensors for temperature and pressure, that has a wireless power supply, it gets power ambiently, and it has wireless data transmission to transmit that. This is turning someone into a cyborg, actually happening in the lab right now. To data input via new technologies, beyond Google Glass in the lab right now, we have the first working examples of LCD contact lenses that can be worn and transmit photons directly to the eye or even more invasive cyborg technologies that more directly network the human body. This is the pill cam, and this is a clinical technology in use in thousands of patients since 2008. It's about two centimeters long. You swallow it, and it goes through your digestive tract, through your intestines, and it has three cameras that take two megapixel pictures. They're a little bit slow, or a little bit old, I'm afraid, but it takes 30 frames per second, flashing its LEDs, and then it sends them out wirelessly to instruments in the room. So instead of having to have a much more invasive procedure that might have come in through the other end, you just swallow this pill, it finds out whether or not you have cancer, whether or not anything has to happen, and perhaps in the future it'll have its own little lasers and we'll just fix the problem. While all of those are awesome, I want to go beyond that and actually talk about the human brain and interfacing that. Because I think that in the long run, when we're talking about the Internet of Things, which you hear so much about, the thing that most of us are most concerned about is ourselves. Our health, our bodies, our minds. That is the number one subject that we want to get more data about. So we've been actually sending data digitally into the human brain for quite some time now. This is a cochlear implant. A cochlear implant looks like a hearing aid, but it's not the same. It picks up sound waves, but it transmits them via a long electrode directly to the nervous system, the auditory nerve, as a series of coded electrical impulses that the brain can interpret. And that can restore hearing to people that no hearing aid can help. It's already helped 200,000 people around the world that no hearing aid could help, like this four-year-old girl hearing for the first time in her life. 
or like the video you're about to see of a six-month-old boy hearing the first sound ever in his life as data is digitally sent into his brain. Here we go, it's coming back on, and he's back on again. See how he turns? Hi, Jonathan. That's the sucking. So Jonathan there is a cyborg, actually. He has digital input into his brain. And some of the things we're going to talk about are going to be a little bit crazy, but I want to ground us in this. The first and foremost motivation for these technologies is medical. It's to help people. It's humanitarian. And it's helping hundreds of thousands of people. Now, for most of us, hearing is a very, very important sight or sense, but sight is an even more important sense, and we've also made progress on that. Ten years ago, this picture appeared in Wired magazine. This is a man named Jens Nauman. Jens, at age 18, lost one of his eyes in an accident. He had a very outdoorsy, adventurous lifestyle. He didn't want to compromise on that. So he kept living that lifestyle. And at age 19, the next year, in another tragic accident, a piece of a clutch on a snowmobile flew up and destroyed his other eye. He was left completely blind. Until 20 years later, at age 39, doctors affixed this CCD camera on his eyeglasses. It's sort of like the camera in your phone, except it's 10 years old, so it's much, much worse. It captures photons, it uh, stores them as data, it transmits them during, down that wire that you see to a small microprocessor, which then transforms them to a different format and sends them in that format along another cable that goes up to a jack in the back of Jens's skull. Sort of like Keanu Reeves, if you will. Now, in the primary visual cortex, which is where this leads, there are several billion neurons. Not millions, several billion neurons. This cable has 256 data channels. So you wouldn't think it could do very much at all. But it produces what we call limited mobility vision. What does that mean? Well, here is Jens using that limited mobility vision to drive a convertible. I was able to very carefully drive and look from my left side to my right side, making sure I was between the row of trees on the right and the building on the left. And when I got near um, any obstruction in the front, I would see that there was an obstruction. I would also see the lack of obstructions. And then when I backed up, I would be able to um, inspect for obstructions there. It was really a nice feeling. It was really a nice feeling, he says. Now, you'll notice that I wasn't in the car with Jens. In fact, no one's in the car with Jens. No one's in the parking lot at all. Jens actually had terrible vision. He sees in a 16-pixel by 16-pixel black and white grid. You would not trade your vision for Jens's. But two things. One, that's a quantum leap up from zero pixels. And two, it's a proof of principle that we can take digital information and send it, vision, digital vision, and send it into the human brain. Now, any good interface is not just one way. It's not just data input, it's data output. And we can go the other way as well. This patient, Johnny Ray, was rendered paralyzed from the neck down by a stroke. An emergency tracheotomy to save his life destroyed his ability to speak. His only way to communicate was to blink his eyes once for no, twice for yes. But doctors implanted a single electrode in the motor cortex of his brain, the part that controls motion, specifically the part that controlled motion of his right hand. And that gave Johnny Ray the ability to think about moving an on-screen cursor and use that to type out messages to his friends and family on an on-screen keyboard. Again, a quantum leap up from just blinking. And the newest versions of these systems, now in early human trials, now give people the ability to move three-axis or four-axis robotic arms. Not quite as well as you move yours, but well enough that they can feed themselves, for instance. So that's making good progress. We've also taken vision also out of the human brain. So in this experiment, patients were placed in an fMRI, a non-invasive brain scanner. They were shown this image on the left. They were shown actually video clips on the left. And the brain scanner looked at just what was happening in their brain, just the brain activity, and tried to decode what they were looking at. And while it wasn't perfect, it could put together a decent reconstruction of what they were looking at. And in fact, improvements in just the software side, in just the algorithms of this, have gotten so good that now 
it can tell what letter of the alphabet you're staring at if you stare at it for long enough. Okay. So we've done amazing things. Now, we humans are more than just sensation and motion. We have these higher functions. We think, we learn, we remember, and we've done work on that as well. This actor, Guy Pearce, played the character Lenny in the movie Memento. Lenny can't form new long-term memories. He will see something, he'll know it for a little while, within a minute or two it'll be gone. Now that's an extreme case, but cases like that actually happen. And millions of less severe cases happen to patients that have damage to part of their brain called the hippocampus. So doctors at the University of Southern California, led by a man named Theodore Berger, have created what they call a hippocampus chip that replaces the damaged part of your brain, called the hippocampus. And when they've implanted it in rats, they're trying to see, can we restore the ability of these rats to form new memories? And the answer is yes. A rat that has damage to the campus can't learn new things very well. When they put in their chip, it can. But then they can improve it. The rat can learn things better. And even more than that, they can store sessions. So the rat can be taught a maze. That session of data can be captured, and then a year later, which for a rat is about 30 years in a human lifetime, the rat can be shown the same maze, and the memory can be replayed just beforehand. And the rat will run the maze perfectly, as if it had just run it seconds ago, because the memory has been completely refreshed. And a few of us might like that ability from time to time. And in fact, these folks are working on their early human data capture in 2014 and their first full-stage human trials of this technology for people with brain damage in 2015. So I'm sorry, none of you are probably eligible to be candidates uh, unless you take a very severe fall between now and then. But maybe at some point, it'll be more widely available. What about decision-making, IQ, if you will? Well, these rhesus monkeys have been trained on a monkey IQ test. It's called a pick-and-match test. They are shown an image, and then much later, they're shown a confusing panoply of images and forced to pick the one that they saw before out of that set. It's the closest thing we have to a monkey IQ test. Okay. At the same time, they have a chip in their frontal cortex that is looking at their brain activity as they're going through this test. And it's trying to figure out what does brain activity look like when they get the answer right versus wrong. And it's learns that pattern. Then the monkeys have their pattern of brain activity or have their performance on the test impeded. The performance goes down. It's done so by giving them large doses of cocaine. So the monkeys think their performance has gone up on the test, but in fact it's going down. But the question is now, when they turn the chip into an active mode where it's able to intercede in those brain circuits and change them, can it restore that activity? If it sees a wrong answer being formed, can it fix it? And the answer is yes, and more. In fact, this brain chip can improve the performance of these monkeys on this test by 10 points on a 1 to 100 point scale, leading to the planet of the cyborg apes, our first evidence of, of boosting intelligence in a non-human animal, if you will. Now, those are very interesting, but I, I want to talk about communication. Because there was a time that those devices you have in your laps that I have in my pocket were used primarily for word processing or for uh, spreadsheets, but now, really, they're communication devices. That's how they've changed the world. And I think this technology will be no different. And we've gotten very good at using it to communicate. At another study funded by DARPA, part of the US Department of Defense, two monkeys are placed in separate rooms with soundproofing between them. But the monkeys have electrodes in their auditory cortex, the part of the brain that handles hearing. And when one monkey has played a sound, the other monkey is able to hear that sound and identify what that sound is. Monkey to monkey telepathy, if you will. This is funded by DARPA's advanced battlefield communications program. Their, uh, their work in increasing communication abilities between soldiers in a squad. But you can see the civilian applications as well. Or consider this. Two rats in this study are in identical cages. They have a link between their motor cortex, the part of the brain that controls motion. One rat is trained on how to respond to a series of lights to pull a lever. Which lever should the rat pull based on the lights? The other rat has never been trained. But when the link is activated, the second rat starts to pull the right lever. Not all the time, 
but 60, 70% of the time just gets the answer right, all of a sudden with no training. That's cool. What's even more interesting is where the rats are. One of the rats is at a laboratory in Duke University in North Carolina. The other rat is in a laboratory in Sao Paulo, Brazil thousands of miles away. Because once you liberate data from the brain and make it digital, it can go anywhere the web can go, anywhere digital data can be sent. Or even more recently, at the University of Washington, one mile from my home in the US, these two computer scientists played a video game together as a single player. The researcher on the left can see the screen he sees when a good guy walks by, he sees when a bad guy walks by, which one they should shoot, which one they shouldn't. But he can't push any buttons. He doesn't have the keyboard. The researcher on the right has the keyboard and can press the fire button, but doesn't see the screen. What happens is the researcher on the left thinks, let's fire. The EEG cap on his skull picks up his intention, and then a mile away, the magnetic pedestal on his colleague's skull sends a magnetic pulse that sends a small current through part of the, his colleague's motor cortex that causes his colleague's finger to twitch, firing the fire button. His colleague has become an extension of his body, in essence, and together they win the game. It's an easy game, actually, to be clear, but nevertheless. And now Theodore Berger and his team, who built that hippocampus chip that can store memories offline, they are talking about what would happen if we had two rats that both had a chip in their brains, and one rat learned the maze. And the other rat didn't, never saw the maze, but it just sat there and received data passively. Would the second rat suddenly know something about how to run the maze? Would it do better than chance? Very likely it would. And how far is that from the great philosopher Keanu Reeves' statement of, I know Kung Fu? Well, I don't want to deceive you. It's actually quite far. There's a long way to go. I'm probably stretching the boundaries of the next 10 years or even the next 20 or 30. Because there are some issues. Issue one is, this is your brain. Who here is excited about voluntary brain surgery? Okay. Not me, actually. Let me, let me put my hands behind my back. If you are blind or deaf or have suffered major brain injury, the benefits are very, very great. If you're healthy, the risks have to come down and the benefits have to come up before you're going to be very excited about that. So that's barrier one. Barrier two is, uh-oh, some, some problem here. Well, barrier two is we know computers are perfect and flawless, and we've never, ever seen any malfunction in any electronic system in society. Therefore, it's totally fine to go ahead and just put them in your brain. There is no barrier two. Nor is there any barrier three, because you don't expect a virus to ever infect any digital system, or malware, or spam ads to enlarge certain parts of your body, to be permanently stuck inside your brain. Nor do you expect the US NSA to be looking for metadata about your thoughts and categorizing what any of them are, or so on. All of that having been said, I'm actually very optimistic about the trajectory of these technologies. And I am because of the history of information technology. We are the communication species. It's what makes us special more than anything else, even more than our individual intelligence. Throughout history, we've invented more and more communication technologies, and those have had a very predictable trajectory. The printing press massively increased our ability to communicate ideas, and that did a number of things. One, it created huge business opportunities for printing as a service for consumers who wanted data, for publishers who wanted to send out data. But it did some other things. It massively increased the rate at which scientific and technological innovation happened. This is one of the most important books of all time, a book written by Isaac Newton. This book was written a century after the printing press. It was only possible because Newton was able to ingest the ideas of hundreds of other thinkers whose knowledge he had access to because those ideas were published in books that he could gain access to. And then Newton himself could take his ideas, calculus, which is in this book, invented and published in this book, and spread that to hundreds and thousands of other people. Every invention and technology in this room, your MacBooks, your cell phone, this screen, the antibiotics that might have saved your life, all exist only because we increased our ability to communicate ideas. Every business 
founded on those technologies exists only because we increase our ability to spread ideas. Right? But it did more than that as well. It also democratized information. This is one of the world's first newspapers, printed in 1609. For the first time with the printing press, citizens could gain access to information about what was happening in their community, in their town, their city, their country, their world. And that changed the relationship between the governed and those who govern them. In fact, it allowed people to spread crazy, heretical new ideas like this idea by the great British philosopher John Locke, who spread the idea that perhaps we ought to tolerate those who had a different religion than we do, or that we had a different race than we do. And in fact, these crazy ideas, what we now call the Enlightenment, again, only possible because of the easier spread of idea from person to person, went on to influence the ideals of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, even the very idea of civil rights is a new phenomenon that was only made possible by the cheap dissemination, easy, democratized, uncontrolled dissemination of information. In fact, every step forward in civil liberties that has ever happened has been made possible by new communication technologies that have made it possible for us to hear the voices of people whose voices we previously didn't hear, to see people we previously didn't see, to empathize with them, to, in some sense, through information technology, see through the eyes of others. That's a metaphor. Or it has been a metaphor until now. But at some point in the near future, it may actually be possible to see out of someone else's eyes and gain an idea of what their life is like. And so that's why I'm optimistic that increased communication technology in general, and also including the brain-to-brain -brain tech that I'm talking about, has the power to increase our pace of innovation, to build tremendous new business value, and also to make a world that is a more democratic and more fair one. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. I have, I have one question, though. Okay. Can I... Can I download your book already in my mind? Well, let's talk afterward, backstage. Uh, can I only... I've got a, a very early alpha version, so if you'll sign a waiver for me, I think... I will, I will. Thank you so much, Rob. <laughs> <laughs>